we are live we are live So you want to start or you want me to start? You can start. Sir. Okay, start. Yeah. So in today's eye focus, we have Dr. Santosh Hanavar speaking to us on uh, tumors of the lacrimal gland. And um, yeah. he's been introduced several times now on eye focus. So we move on to his presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matika, for a very short introduction. So what is this 50-50, Ruju? The title is Lacrimal Gland Lesions 50-50. What, what does that mean? What do you think it means? So earlier it was believed that 50% of the tumors are epithelial and 50% of the tumors are non-epithelial, out of which 50% are benign and 50% malignant. And out of that 50% of malignant, 50% are adenoid cystic carcinoma. That's fine. So uh, it's not tumors, but we can, you know, reword it as lesions. Lesions include tumors, non-tumorous conditions, everything. So this is 50% of lacrimal gland masses or lesions are supposed to be non-epithelial and 50% are epithelial. That's a very simple classification. And currently with the available data, we know that it does not conform to 50-50. It is actually 70-30 or 60-40 or 65-35 depending on the region from which it is reported, right? So what is this non-epithelial lesions? What do you think are the non-epithelial lesions? Uh, Lymphoproliferative uh, lesions. Mm. Um, Other non-epithelial non lesions, if you want to say which is most common non-epithelial lesion of the lacrimal gland? NSOID. Is it? Are you sure? Then I'll go to the next slide. So what is most common is infection, isn't it? Specific orbital inflammation secondary to infection is most common. So dacryoadenitis is the most common non-epithelial affection of the lacrimal gland. That is followed by inflammation, which could either be specific non-infectious inflammation or non-specific orbital inflammation, either of which. So inflammation is a second category, is the second category. And the third category is lymphoproliferative lesion, which is not so common at all. In fact, about 10 to 20% of non-epithelial lesions are contributed to by lymphoproliferative conditions, which could be benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, atypical lymphoid hyperplasia or indeterminate or lymphoma. So... Uh, this being the classification and we know that infection and infestation are most common, we should very seriously learn the differential diagnosis of infection and inflammatory conditions. Now, Subha, looking at this child, young adult, right? What do you think is your diagnosis? Um, Look at the features very carefully. Histories of just five to six days. Uh, can you just narrate the history from patient's perspective? Looking at this picture, can you narrate her history? A uh, sudden onset of uh, swelling and associated with pain and mild redness in both. Do you think areas. so? This was seen at the height of EKC. Right? So, what would she have started with? Would she have started with lacrimal gland swelling or would she have started with conjunctivitis? Conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis. Most of the adenoviral dacryoadenitis start off with conjunctivitis and during the receding phase of conjunctivitis, they manifest with dacryoadenitis. Only after about 3 to 5 or even 7 days and some after resolution of conjunctivitis manifest with Dacryoadenitis. In this patient, you see that she has very mild congestion left anymore, but then she has predominant lacrimal gland swelling. Right. So, which part of the gland is involved here, Subha? So, so palpebral lobe. Palpebral lobe. Why do you think so? A viral conjunctivitis, uh, 
No, we don't know whether it, it's viral or not. Patient is sitting in front of you. You have to yeah. diagnose. Yeah. This is bilateral, symmetrical. Why do you say it is palpebral lobe? Why not orbital lobe? The S-shaped deformity of the lid is uh, pretty much evident in uh, both the eyes. It is very typical of palpebral lobe involvement, but that does not preclude concurrent orbital lobe involvement, which can only be gauged if it's unilateral by asymmetric proptosis or displacement of the eye. Correct? Yes. This appears to be palpebral lobe involvement because of fullness of the lateral one-third of the lid, obliteration of the lid crease in the lateral one-third of the lid, and also that S-shaped deformity, correct? So yes. this appears to be bilateral symmetrical involvement of the palpebral lobe. We can't be sure about the orbital lobe. And she has residual temporal conjunctival congestion. All of this point to the fact that she may have had a previous episode of viral, viral conjunctivitis following which she has dacryoadenitis. So infective or infectious dacryoadenitis has many etiologies, viral, bacterial, parasitic right so we have to know what are the features of each of this now this patient as we already discussed has adenoviral dacryoadenitis now what about this patient this patient has absolute white eye correct she does not seem, seem to have concurrent conjunctivitis but she has slight amount of s-shaped deformity of the lateral aspect of the lid but she has a bulging of the lacrimal gland. This is subacute in onset. Few days, maybe a couple of weeks. So what do you think is the etiology here? Where there is no conjunctivitis. Can dacryoadenitis happen in viral etiology without conjunctivitis? Yes, sir. Which one is that? Epstein-Barr virus. Mm -hmm. And? Mumps. Mumps and? Uh, herpes simplex and herpes zoster. Zoster, I'm not sure. Yes, yeah, so this is again bilateral palpebral lobe affection, dacryoadenitis, without any apparent conjunctivitis. And this patient has a viral conjunctivitis, no history of viral conjunctivitis. So obviously she had some viral infection. She had upper respiratory tract infection, following which this developed. So possibly we cannot rule out you know, the et or we cannot be very sure of the etiology of which virus might have caused it, but this was following URI. So any virus causing URI can also cause concurrent dacryoadenitis. What do you think is this? Much severe inflammation, periocular, as well as asymmetrical dacryoadenitis in a patient who has not had conjunctivitis. Uh, Predominant yeah. inflammation, more periocular skin, also involving the upper lid and the lacrimal gland. Little bit of erythematous appearance. More inflammation is suggestive of dengue asso associated dacryoadenitis. And this is mumps dacryoadenitis. This patient child had mumps and after which he developed dacryoadenitis, unilateral dacryoadenitis. It could be bilateral. Mom's dacryoadenitis is typically bilateral, but children can develop unilateral dacryoadenitis. This is one such example. You can see dacryoadenitis involving the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland very clearly. Now, this is a patient with bilateral dacryoadenitis, right? So, does this involve the orbital lobe as well? There is... A Hmm? There is asymmetric uh, involvement. Asymmetric involvement. So this is the same child who had this dacryoadenitis. Although clinically it is not evident on the right side, when you do imaging, it is possible that the patient has bilateral dacryoadenitis, whereas one eye was very severe, where the other eye was mild. This patient had concurrent pneumonia and dacryoadenitis. So, there are variations in dacryoadenitis. They may not present at the same time as the patient has systemic infection. Sometimes they may present metachronously. Sometimes they may present synchronously. What do you think is this? Um, well, how do you 
there is a, a fullness uh, um, in the left upper lid with mm. proposis, mm. with obliteration of the lid crease. Mm. And, uh, the diagnosis is already obvious. Yeah. This patient has conjunctivitis and also chemosis. From his conjunctiva was cultured pseudomonas. So, obviously, it was a spillover kind of infection of the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland. This is bacterial dacryoadenitis. This is tubercular dacryoadenitis. Looking at this patient, we cannot say that it is tubercular, but tubercular dacryoadenitis predominantly involves the orbital lobe as well. This is the only uh, bacterial dacryoadenitis that involves the orbital lobe of the lacrimal gland. Otherwise, unless there is an abscess, orbital lobe is spared. This is the CT scan of this patient. You can see predominant involvement of the orbital lobe of the lacrimal gland. That is cysticercosis. So parasitic infections can also occur within the lacrimal gland. This was cysticercosis of the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland with spillover inflammation of the lateral rectus. So whenever you have a patient with lacrimal gland swelling, you have to rule out infectious etiology. And this is a summary of what we have already discussed with pictures. Infectious etiology can be acute, subacute. Pain is the predominant symptom. So there will be signs of inflammation such as eyelid edema, periocular inflammation, S-shaped deformity of the eyelid and also obliteration of the lid crease. What is very characteristic is hyperlacrimation in viral dacryoadenitis and in bacterial dacryoadenitis it is hypolacrimation may not always be translating to high shermers or low shermers, especially hyperlacrimation in bacterial dacryoadenitis is, uh, you know, it could be even be because of conjunctivitis. So you cannot be very sure that it is because of dacryoadenitis alone, but that is what is said. In viral dacryoadenitis, 80 to 90% are bilateral, more often symmetric. And they occur more in the orbital lobe of the lacrimal gland except adenoviral dacryoadenitis which occurs with concurrent conjunctivitis or in the resolving phase of conjunctivitis. Other etiologies as you have rightly mentioned were Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster virus and mumps. Now in non-viral dacryoadenitis 80 to 90 percent are unilateral whereas here in viral 80 to 90 percent are bilateral more involving the palpebral lobe except Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is the dacryoadenitis of bacterial etiology that involves the orbital lobe. Now, these are the common etiologies for bacterial dacryoadenitis Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Gonococcus, Haemophilus influenzae, Pseudomonas, Moraxella, tuberculosis, and fungus can also cause Aspergillus and Fusarium, and of course, Cysticercosis. Right, so, take home points for dacryoadenitis viral, bilateral, hyperlacrimation orbital lobe except adenovirus, bacterial, typically unilateral, hypolacrimation, and mostly in the palpable lobe. Next is inflammatory dacryoadenitis. Now, what, what do you know about inflammatory dacryoadenitis? Subha, can you describe this condition non-stop in one minute? Um, I have a slight bandwidth issue. Let me just check. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Inflammatory dacryoadenitis can be non-specific or specific mm. and might involve both the orbital as well as the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland. Okay. It can be unilateral or bilateral. Now, looking at it, whether it is subacute or chronic, inflammation can be acute, subacute and chronic. Acute is mostly infective. Correct? Yeah. Now, subacute and chronic could be specific or non-specific. Depending on whether it is subacute or chronic, whether it is unilateral or bilateral, whether it is involving the palpebral lobe predominantly, orbital lobe predominantly, or both equally, would you be able to arrive at a differential diagnosis? Yes, sir. Tell me. Tell me, go ahead. That will complete the class if you tell that. Do it. Ruju?
ಓನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಅಟೆಂಪ್ಟ್ ಸಚ್ ಅ ಲಾಂಗ್ ಸೈಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ಅಬಿಯಸ್ಲಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಗೋ ಎಟ್ ದಟ್ so this is the definition non specific non infective inflammation without identifiable local or systemic cause is is dacroidin non specific dacroidin actus so these are the other types of non specific inflammation of the orbit myositis anterior diffuse apical and perineuritis dacroidinitis has been kept second because it is second most common of common variety of non specific dacroidinitis it can be unilateral bilateral as we already described acute subacute or chronic and there is role of schirmer's what is the role of schirmer's test in dacroidinitis inflammatory dacroidinitis it's generally low in acute or subacute or even chronic phase of dacroidinitis but on treatment there is recovery right what about lymphoproliferative lesions schirmer's is affected in lymphoproliferative lesions or not generally not affected what if it is adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland schirmer's is no low the changing paradigm is this of course in 2023 2024 it may be much different earlier majority of dacroidinitis were considered non specific about 70% only about 30% was specific now since we have started doing biopsy more often than not majority of dacroidinitis are currently specific because we have been able to point out the etiology after doing biopsy and based on histopathology and serology and also radiological appearance only one third remain non specific or undiagnosed currently so the role of biopsy is very very clear 30 to 50% of lacrimal gland inflammations have associated systemic disorder or a simulating lesion jogren syndrome is quite common especially in the whites and japanese sclerosing inflammation of the lacrimal gland or sclerosing nsoid as we call it can be associated with mediastinal fibrosis and retroperitoneal fibrosis sarcoid is not so common but autoimmune disease and lymphoproliferative lesions are fairly common like this patient with bilateral symmetrical chronic dacroidinitis with low schirmer's involving the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland chronic bilateral low schirmer's symmetrical lady so what do you suspect sjogren syndrome sjogren syndrome absolutely right so in such a patient when you do imaging you may also find that there would be orbital lobe involvement right and this is the patient chogren syndrome diagnosed and on treatment there was not much of reduction in the size of the lacrimal gland but then there was reasonable response so this young lady has predominantly left sided dacroidinitis and because of displacement of the eye medially possibly that she has both palpebral lobe as well as the orbital lobe involvement looks like right and she has that on ct scan so what do you suspect here what kind of dacroidinitis would you suspect in a young lady or would you suspect a lacrimal gland tumor here Mm. yeah possible right yeah possible so what is the next step then looking at this scan do you still think that she has a lacrimal gland tumor or do you suspect dacroidinitis we know that common lacrimal gland tumors are pleomorphic adeno adenoma adenosis adenoid cystic carcinoma and adenocarcinoma does it confirm to any of that no no she has a irregular contour not spheroid or spherical which is pleomorphic adenoma there is no bone change as you see here there is no crossing of the lesion beyond the midline right yeah. and this is subacute to chronic less than a year right young lady do so you suspect dacroidinitis and this actually was a 
firm to hard mass. This really looked like a tumor during dissection, but it was sclerosing nonspecific orbital inflammation. Sclerosing in SOID actually can mimic a lacrimal gland tumor clinically and even radiologically. But what is the giveaway is that there is no bone change and the contour is not rounded. And like a pleomorphic adenoma, which has a very nice rounded contour or a spheroid or a spherical appearance. This is irregular. The second important feature which you can, which the MRI expert can tell you is periosteum is thickened in sclerosing in SOID. In fact, you can see that this patient underwent end block excision that is the edge of the periosteum. See, you can see that the periosteum is thickened. This is one lesion where the periosteum is completely adherent to the lacrimal gland mass, exactly like adenoid cystic carcinoma. But the color is pink, whereas adenoid cystic carcinoma is bluish pink. Right? It has more of bluish tinge than pinkness and this is hard. So the only two lesions which are as hard as this and have periosteal adhesion are sclerosing in SOID. Second is chronic granulomatous dacroidinactus. Third, of course, is adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is bluish. So even during dissection or surgery, you will be able to understand that this is sclerosing in SOID. Right. This young lady comes with low hemoglobin right, and bilateral, not very dramatic, but subtle dacroidinitis. Recurrent dacroidinitis in the left eye, subtle dacroidinitis in the right eye. This was IgG photolated disease. And the only way could, we could diagnose this was by histopathology. Right. If you had not diagnosed her or subjected her to histopathology, you would have missed the important diagnosis of IgG4 related disease. Why is that important? Could we have not have not done a biopsy and treated on her only with oral steroids or something of that sort or non-specific or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications? Would it have done her any harm at all if you have done that? Why did we have to do a biopsy or why do we do a biopsy in a patient with dacroidinitis? Is it important to know what is the underlying cause? Why do you think so? Uh, yes, sir. Because uh, if we know that this is a case of IgG4 related disease, hmm. then uh, it will have a systemic implication. What, so what are the systemic implications? Cholangitis, uh, pancreatitis. Hmm. And? How do you diagnose IgG4 related disease? Serum IgG4 levels. Uh, there is a ratio. Of what, is, IgG4 what, is the, what is the current criteria? 2022 criteria? Ratio of IgG4 to plasma cells more than 40 per high power field. Ratio high power field. You're mixing two criteria, I think. What is the first criteria for IgG4 disease currently? Clinical radiological appearance. The organ must be involved. Here, it is a lacrimal gland. So, there has to be a visible mass in the organ that is lacrimal gland on radiology. That is the first criteria, right? And there is in this patient. You can see that there is a mass in the lacrimal gland. All right. What is the second criteria? Second criteria is histopathology. In histopathology, there are three criteria, not one. What are the three criteria? Two are seen here on this slide. Hmm? Story form pattern and lymphoplasmocytic cells. Second is more than 10 IgG4 positive cells per high power field. And ratio of IgG4 positive cells or IgG4 positive cells is 40 per, more than 40 percent to non-IgG4 positive cells. And finally, Based on these three criteria, you can diagnose them as definite, probable, or possible. Definite is when all the three criteria are present. Probable is when clinical radiological one and three are present. Possible is when one and two are present. So based on these three criteria, mix and match, you can diagnose IgG4 related disease. And it is evolved into a, I wouldn't say the most common, but at least the third or fourth in the list of etiologies of dacroidinitis currently. So if you start biopsying dacroidinitis as a matter of routine, you'll find more and more IgG4 related disease currently. 
this is again bilateral IgG4 related dacryoadenitis in an elderly individual. So age is not a, a criteria at all. Anybody can develop bilateral or unilateral IgG4 related dacryoadenitis. Okay, this patient has a deformity which is already telling you the diagnosis. What deformity is that? And if you look at her old photograph, she did not have it. Uh, broadening of the nasal bridge. Broadening of the nasal bridge. So whenever a patient comes to you with orbital inflammation, you should ask them if they have this kind of a broad nasal bridge, you should ask them, did they always have it? Or is it of recent onset? Right? Broadening of the nasal bridge indicates what? Collapse of the uh, nasal septum. Hmm. So, In... vaginous granulomatosis. Absolutely right. Part. So, that's a very good clinical pearl. So, if you look at broadening of the nasal bridge in a patient with orbital inflammation, you would suspect vaginous and this patient indeed had vaginous granulomatosis which was confirmed on histopathology. She had a waxing and waning course of orbital inflammation which finally settled down with intravenous methylprednisolone and oral azathioprine. One more patient with vaginous granulomatosis, you can also see here that she has developed acquired telecanthus with some amount of broadening of the nasal bridge and very severe inflammation. This may actually look like preceptal cellulitis to you, that kind of a severe acute manifestation she came with. And diagnosis again here on histopathology was vaginous granulomatosis. And of course, treatment of inflammations you already know we generally start this patient not on oral steroids but intravenous methylprednisolone and when you find good response you continue that alone but if a patient has modest response at the end of third or fourth cycle you reassess and start on immunomodulators this has been already covered in the lecture on orbital inflammations i wouldn't go into it but i would just want to stress the role of biopsy specifically in lacrimal gland inflammation because that is a giveaway that will give you a lot of lead in terms of the specific etiology of a patient. And why should you use intravenous methylprednisolone? It acts by many ways. One is dampening of the inflammatory cytokine cascade. In, in, it inhibits the activation of T lymphocytes. And in fact, with each cycle of intravenous methylprednisolone, about 60 to 70 percent of abnormal circulating activated T lymphocytes will be taken away from circulation. So at the end of six pulses, the patient will be left with non-critical a volume of activated T lymphocytes in circulation that will cause remission of the disease. So these are other uh, mechanisms of IV methylprednisolone. I won't go into the details. All right. So what do you think is this? Unilateral or bilateral? Uh, bilateral, sir. Bilateral. Symmetrical, asymmetrical? Uh, asymmetrical. More on the left than the right. Mm -hmm. And what about this? They all looked like viral dacryoadenitis, isn't it? But they were all immunologically mediated dacryoadenitis. Although they looked like palpable lobe affection, they also had orbital lobe infection affection. They're all biopsy proven immunologically mediated dacryoadenitis. Chronic non-specific dacryoadenitis. This also looks like viral. So you can see that from these pictures that there is a huge overlay between viral dacryoadenitis and immunologically mediated dacryoadenitis. What may look like viral may actually turn out to be immunologically mediated dacryoadenitis. So you have to be very careful when you start them on empiric steroids. You have to get a biopsy in a majority of patients with dacryoadenitis. Unless they are very, very clearly viral. You can see this patient again resolved with intravenous methylprednisolone. So inflammation, you should have a very throw, low threshold for biopsy. Any patient with dacryoadenitis where it's not very clear that this patient has viral dacryoadenitis, you should do biopsy before you start on any form of steroids. If you're very clear or if there's a correlated, correlatable history that this patient has bacterial or viral dacryoadenitis, then that is fine. There you really don't have to worry about biopsy, otherwise biopsy becomes almost mandatory. Pulse in the intravenous methylprednisolone followed by long-term oral immunomodulation is ideal for non-specific dacryoadenitis. All right. What do you think is this? There is a fullness of the upper lid with the 
fibroglobus okay uh, possibly uh, which indicates that it is a and proptosis basically so it indicates that orbital lobe and palpebral lobe both might be involved okay so this patient we thought that he had immune mediated dacryoadenitis did biopsy biopsy showed benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia so what would you do next and you know me right i do biopsy from epicenter. superficial mid zone and deep right past the epicenter so this is representative biopsy correct yeah, yeah. so this was benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia on histopathology treated this patient on systemic steroids he resolved although his aponeurotic ptosis persisted he remained resolved for several months i think almost a year and a half then he had multiple recurrences three or four subtle recurrences and finally he had a major recurrence and we did a repeat incisional biopsy do you think it is justified to do repeat incisional biopsy in a patient who has already been diagnosed as benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia is that something uh, some kind of a over intervention do you think no sir it is Why? because one because it is recurrent we have to possibly rule out um, uh, transformation into a, a lymphoma or a lympho a proliferative disease so. absolutely right so it is possible that any patient who has a prior diagnosis of benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia comes back to you with recurrences following remission then it is possible that it has evolved into atypical lymphoid hyperplasia or lymphoma right that is the need for biopsy and here when we did a repeat biopsy found that he has evolved into non hodgkins lymphoma frank lymphoma he had evolved into so this was one of the first few cases of similar sort that we encountered of course he underwent systemic evaluation which was negative and then he underwent radiation he settled down but then here when we went back to the previous sections we were unable to pick up any clonality pathologist actually went back to the previous sections sampling error was unlikely because the surgeon was the same and we had material enough for a pcr to do retrospectively on both the samples the first sample of the first biopsy was negative and the second sample was positive so this was lymphoma in evolution or called marching lymphoma which is a continuation of pathology so it's this patient was fairly clear because he started off with benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia but then there are patients who start with a polyclonal disease they have non specific orbital inflammation with predominant lymphocytes but of polyclonal in nature they may evolve into monoclonal disease that is lymphoma over a period of time so it's not that biopsy is one time biopsy if a patient recurs and does not settle down easily with non steroidal anti inflammatory medications or a short course of oral steroids and rebounds you are mandated to do a repeat biopsy now if a patient has bilateral dacryoadenitis in fact some surgeons are very clear that you should do bilateral lacrimal gland biopsy because one eye may have benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia whereas the other eye may have lymphoma one eye may have non specific orbital inflammation other eye may have a lymphoproliferative lesion so with bilateral dacryoadenitis generally if you are less aggressive you do only with the biopsy from the more severe eye isn't it more severe eye more amenable tissue anteriorly located where you can do with a you know small incision and a local anesthesia that you choose out patients but there are suggestions that you should do bilateral lacrimal gland biopsy so you should remember that biopsy is not one time sometimes you may have to do a biopsy again if the patient recurs and you should be aware that all these conditions can evolve into lymphoma ultimately lymphoproliferative lesions i think you have had a wonderful class last time so i really don't want to repeat anything except to point out that any lymphoproliferative lesion of the lacrimal gland maintains its character radiologically like other lymphoproliferative lesions of the orbit it molds around the eyeball like this although it is a lacrimal gland lesion you can see nice molding around the eyeball the patient will not generally have functional problems such as restriction of ocular motility etc although it seems to involve the insertion of the lateral rectus muscle the muscle function itself will remain normal in 
lymphoproliferative lesions. That is one giveaway. Whereas if this were to be, say, sclerosing an SOID, it wouldn't be molding around the eyeball. And secondly, if there is spillover inflammation of the lateral rectus, then the patient will have ocular motility restriction. So clinically, there are clues to differentiate one from the other. Looks like dacroidinitis, but this patient also had orbital lymphoma. So in patient with any lymphoproliferative lesion, biopsy is confirmatory. That is followed by systemic evaluation and then whatever that is required for the orbital lesion. Low-dose radiation or if the patient has systemic manifestations, then of course chemotherapy. Now going on to epithelial lesion. To, you, to begin with said that 50% are benign, 50% are malignant and 50% are adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is not really true. There are more benign tumors than malignant tumors. About 60 to 70% are benign, 30 to 40% are malignant. And adenoid cystic carcinoma is the most predominant malignant tumor. Adenocarcinoma, there are very few case reports. There are other malignant tumors as well. But adenoid cystic carcinoma is rare, but it is the most common malignant tumor of the lacrimal gland. What do you think is this? Obviously, we'll start with benign lesions, isn't it? Going systematically. So do you think it's a benign tumor or something else? You need to know the history, palpate. Yeah, you can palpate, but history is that she has had this for a few years very slowly increasing in size. And there is a history of waxing and waning also. No pain, no other symptoms. Decryops. Was that a guess? Yeah, this was indeed a decryops, a very large decryops. Dacryops and sometimes even dermoids can occur in this region. There are dermoids that occur in the lacrimal gland itself. So they may simulate lacrimal gland tumor. So this is one such simulation where a dacryops simulated like a pleomorphic adenoma of the lacrimal gland. Benign epithelial lesions, these are the four of which oncocytoma, Varzin's tumors and myoepithelioma are extremely, extremely rare. Possibly if you have a busy oculoplasty, orbital tumor practice, you may see one in five, six years, the last three. But pleomorphic adenoma is most common. Most common epithelial benign tumor of the lacrimal gland. So clinically, how do you know that a patient has pleomorphic adenoma as opposed to adenoid cystic carcinoma? Are there any clinical clues? Tell me. It is very slow growing, usually hmm. painless. Hmm. Does not cross the midline on palpation. No hmm. bony irregularity palpated hmm. and uh, uh, well circumscribed on uh, radiologic and uh, fossa formation. That's it. And um, tenderness on eliciting uh, to rule out any perineural involvement or you might have a inflammatory component where... Pleomorphic adenoma generally, you know, you don't find... Any any of those manifestations, right? That's adenoid cystic carcinoma. Yeah. Anything else? Is ocular motility restricted? Generally not, unless it is because of a large tumor causing mechanical activity. Do you think it is pleomorphic adenoma? Although the label says so, this patient, contradictory to what you said, has bony defect. In the roof, bony defect in the roof. Okay, there's a clear gap in the roof, and the periosteum seems to be involved, mm -hmm. although it is not affecting the dura apparently. Of course, this is not an MRI scan, you can't be very clear. But this patient does have fossa formation as compared to the other side, but has a bony defect. And this kind of erosion of a bone is possible in a long-standing pleomorphic adenoma. It does not completely rule out the possibility of adenoid cystic carcinoma. And in fact, it is said that pleomorphic adenoma does not cause indentation of the eyeball. Choroidal folds are very, very rare in pleomorphic adenoma. But this patient has clear-cut indentation of the eyeball. So there are mixed features. 
but it is a well circumscribed lesion could easily be accessed does not really adherent to the dura okay i'm just showing you the variation so that you understand typically said that pleomorphic adenoma does not cross the midline right here is one example where it has crossed the midline and gone over on the medial side right yeah, yeah. And also it is irregular. Fossa formation has some kind of a V or a lazy V kind of a contour. Fossa formation generally is supposed to be very nice and rounded. Whereas this looks like some amount of erosion, but it did turn out to be pleomorphic adenoma, very well circumscribed lesion. So typically you say that it causes only fossa formation, does not cross the midline, does not cause ocular motility restriction. It is spheroid. We have seen irregular pleomorphic adenoma. Here is one. You can see this out poaching. So nodularity can be seen. There are patients who have broken through the capsule. The lesion has broken through the capsule and is forming a distinct nodule. This you find during surgery. So it's important that you get the entire lesion out without disturbing its capsule. Now this is one patient where there is irregularity of the bone. See this? Right? Yeah. It's very, very unlike pleomorphic adenoma, isn't it? You can see erosion of the bone or sort of thing of the bone with. You can see this particular area of the bone actually seems to have been infiltrated. You can see that the lesion is crossing the midline, but it did turn out to be pleomorphic adenoma of the lateral midline. So the spectrum is very large. Typical cases are there. What is written in the books is true. But in a clinical situation, since diseases don't read books, you find the entire spectrum of lesions. Ultimately, that turns out to be pleomorphic adenoma on histopathology. Surgery has certain principles. Before I start the video, can you tell me the principles of surgery in a pleomorphic adenoma of the lacrimal gland? What are the grounding principles of surgery? Tumor should be removed. Mm -hmm. Tumor should be removed. Is that the principle of surgery? A complete tumor removal with an intact capsule. Mm. Uh, incision really does not matter. Mm. If you strongly favor lit crease incision, if you are sure that it is pleomorphic adenoma, nearly sure, you can go ahead with a lit crease incision or you can do a direct approach. Right? Yeah. And when you excise pleomorphic adenoma, it is ideal not to rupture the capsule, not to hold the capsule at all. And your dissection should be carried out around the tumor without really touching the tumor. And if there is any area where capsule is thin or a capsular breakthrough, like you saw that nodule in the previous case, you should be very careful in that area not to have rupture of the capsule. Why should all this be done? Because um, if there is a capsular breach or if you're not careful in that area, then possibly we are seeding the uh, pleomorphic adenoma content and then that can lead to a recurrence. Okay, so if you seed the pleomorphic adenoma or if you do incomplete excision or if you have residual uh, lesion, then obviously it will cause recurrence. And because you have seeded, that recurrence can be multifocal. The second complication is that these patients can develop adenocarcinoma. Pleomorphic adenocarcinoma, right? The chance of them developing adenocarcinoma is not really higher in patients who have ruptured the capsule, but at least the literature points to the fact that in a patient where there is residual pleomorphic adenoma, they tend to have conversion, which I'm not sure whether it's really so or it is just the kind of cases that are reported that show that entity. But anyway, so you're not supposed to leave behind part of pleomorphic adenoma. So if you find a well-circumscribed lacrimal gland tumor, there is no reason to do an incisional biopsy. You should completely excise it. If periosteum is adherent to it, you can do N block excision, that is, excision of the periosteum that is adherent to the tumor without trying to go in between the periosteum and the tumor itself. So, before you start the surgery, it is ideal to tag the extraocular muscles as we have done here, lateral rectus and the superior rectus. Incision, as I said, is a material. This is a sub row incision that we are doing. Periosteal incision. Periosteal dissection very carefully. 
to see if there is any adherence of the periosteum to the bone. Stop at arcus marginalis. Lateral dissection is being carried out. You should be very careful where you have the suture line. Dissection of the periorbiter with a blunt spatula. Dissection of the periosteum supratemporally to do the marginotomy or excise this overhanging bone so that you get a much better view. All this is in preparation of surgery. Pass suture through skin and the edge of the periosteum. If you're not doing end block dissection, you can pass it through the edge of the periosteum. Otherwise, just skin orbicularis for retraction. Inspect that periosteum is not adherent to the tumor by tenting it. And if it's not adherent, then only you make this periosteal incision. If it is adherent, you come above and do an end block excision. We're incising the peri orbita around the tumor. That's the horizontal incision, which is concentric to the orbital margin. In the vertical incision in the peri orbita, which is pointing towards the orbital apex. Then you hold both the edges of the periosteal incision and pull in opposite direction to make it a V-shaped window. Now I'm holding only the periosteum and dissecting on top of the tumor, not holding the tumor itself at any point during the surgery. All these spatulas are working on the surface of the tumor. And the forceps is on the periosteum. So you can use bimanual dissection technique where you use two spatula. Only when there is a periosteal tag that is apparent on the lateral side do we use a scissor to cut it. Otherwise, there is no role for scissors here. If there is a vascular pedicle, you cauterize it. It is an evident vascular pedicle. You want to cauterize it. Then you bellot the tumor and then see where else is it adherent. Here, the patient has some amount of tumor that is adherent to the superior rectus muscle sheath, which was already evident on the imaging that is freed up. And only when you have separated the tumor from all possible adhesions on the medial and the lateral side and inferiorly and superiorly, except the posterior side, you would apply a cryoprobe. Wait for a nice large ice ball to form. Then you put in the spatula at the back of the tumor and very gently dissect it out. As the tumor comes out, you have to look for the posterior vascular pedicle, which needs to be cauterized. Pleomorphic adenoma is a very easy tumor to excise. The only point of dissection is separation of the palpable lobe of the lacrimal gland if the pleomorphic adenoma is predominantly orbital lesion. Otherwise, if you don't take that precaution to dissect the palpable lobe meticulously, then your tumor will come out with the palpable lobe, which is not a good thing to have because the patient will have dry eye. So that is the end of surgery. Now, this patient has had multiple recurrences of pleomorphic adenoma and you can see that he has undergone a excision elsewhere. It's almost a continuous tumor right from the orbit extending to the temporalis fossa. You can see this is the temporalis muscle and his tumor is, is bilobed and it is extending right up to the temporalis muscle. Somebody has done a lateral orbitotomy bone cut. Generally, we don't do bone cut at all in lacrimal gland tumors, but it was the older uh, possibly surgery where bone cut has been performed and you can see some amount of bone infiltration also. So clinically in such a situation, you are not very clear as to it is indeed a pleomorphic adenoma or a malignant transformation of a pleomorphic adenoma into adenocarcinoma. Here we have to do end block dissections with this patient had bilobed tumor which was taken out with the periosteum that was around it and patient did well. It did turn out to be pleomorphic adenoma. So there was no transformation in this situation. So, recurrence is possible in patients where you have performed suboptimal surgery. So, the rule is that for pleomorphic adenoma, complete excision has to be performed. There is no rule for doing incisional biopsy or incomplete excision. You have to be very careful of the capsule, not to rupture the capsule. Now, going on to malignant epithelial tumors, we have adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is the most common followed by carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma, which means that the patient has had pleomorphic adenoma, which has transformed into adenocarcinoma. Primary adenocarcinoma is extremely rare. There is only a few case reports of primary adenocarcinoma of the lacrimal gland. We also have mucoepidermoid carcinoma of the lacrimal gland, myoepithelial lacrimal gland tumor. 
these cannot be clinical radiologically distinguished one from the other. It's very difficult to distinguish one variant of malignant lacrimal gland tumor from the other by MRI or CT scan. They all look nearly the same. What is this scoring system? Are you familiar with the scoring system? Quickly, yes or no? This is right and row scoring system. For each of this, they give minus one or plus one. Duration of symptoms, less than 10 months, more than 10 months. Persistent pain, present or absent. Sensory loss, present or absent. Radiological, well-defined round or over mass, present or absent. Molding of the mass to globe or along the lateral wall, present or absent. Tumor calcification, present or absent. Invasion of the bone, that means not scalloping, but erosion and invasion, present or absent. Duration of symptoms in relationship to the tumor. Large tumor, small tumor and long duration. So what does this mean to you? This is a way of differentiating benign from malignant lacrimal gland tumors. This scoring system was divided by right and rows based on their series of 100 plus cases of benign and malignant lacrimal gland tumors. You may not score every patient, but these points are already described in the lecture. These are well recognized. Whenever you have a patient where the duration of symptoms is less than one year and a patient has a large lacrimal gland tumor, it is more likely to be malignant. Whereas if the duration of symptoms is more than 10 months or a year and has a smaller lacrimal gland tumor, it's more likely to be benign. Right? Pain, sensory loss or abnormal sensations are present in a neurotrophic tumor such as adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland, whereas these symptoms are absent in a benign tumor. Well differentiate, well defined oval or round mass is adeno, uh, pleomorphic adenoma, whereas irregular in contour for adenoid cystic carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. Molding is absent in pleomorphic adenoma, where it can kind of curve around the eyeball and indent the eyeball in a malignant tumor. Tumor calcification can be present in malignant tumors. Bone invasion already. So they score this and if a patient has minus 6 to plus 2, right, then it is more likely that the patient has a malignant tumor. If a patient has a positive score, it's more likely that the patient has a benign tumor. That is all is the scoring system. It is quite popular for the examiners, examiners to ask sometimes. So you might want to remember at least the name of the scoring system, not the every content of it. This is just to differentiate benign from the malignant tumor. Now, adenocarcinoma mainly is a malignant transformation of pleomorphic adenoma. It's more common than a primary adenocarcinoma. It conforms to multi-step model of carcinogenesis with progressive loss at 8Q, 12Q and finally 17P. So it's very well described mutation that happens in a pleomorphic adenoma for it to develop into adenocarcinoma. At least the literature describes it to happen in incompletely excised benign tumor. It can be polymorphic. Polymorphic would mean a bit of ductal, sebaceous, acinic and basal cell component or any mixture of this or monomorphic, which could have either purely ductal, sebaceous, acinic or basal cell component. So that's about adenocarcinoma theoretical aspect. No, clinically, it is impossible to differentiate adenocarcinoma from pleomorphic, I mean, adeno, adenoid cystic carcinoma at all, clinically as well as radiologically. The only differentiator would be histopathology. So you have to do a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Now, the role of a biopsy can be either incisional or excisional, depending on what is the extent of the tumor. If the tumor is well circumscribed, it is not affecting the critical structures of the orbit, such as lateral rectus, SRLPS complex, then you should aim to completely excise that particular tumor. There is no role for an incisional biopsy in a well-circumscribed tumor that is not affecting the critical orbital structures.
But if a patient has critical orbital structures affected, this patient has ptosis already. Her superior rectus LPS complex is engulfed within the tumor. Upper edge of the lateral rectus is touching the tumor. So suppose I excise it completely, patient will have complete ptosis and hypotropia, which is not a good thing to have. So only an infiltrative tumor would you do incisional biopsy. Otherwise, all lacrimal gland tumors, which are reasonably well circumscribed and moderate in size, are to be excised completely. This is a patient, young patient, with a S-shaped lid deformity. You may think it is dacroidinitis, but it is crossing the midline, and this turned out to be adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland. She had pain, she had abnormal sensation, and this abnormal sensation is because of the neurotrophic activity of the lacrimal gland tumor. You can see how large this tumor is. But again, clinical pointers are fine. But when you look at the scan, you can see that this contour is rather smooth. This looks like as if the patient has a fossa formation, but she had adenoid cystic carcinoma. It is the best known form of lacrimal gland malignancy, relatively rare. Generally, we have middle-aged and currently we have even younger individuals coming with adenoid cystic carcinoma. Pain is a predominant symptom. Paresthesia is a predominant symptom. And there are many forms of treatment for this, which we'll discuss. Rarity, you can know from this literature that 2% only constitutes 2% of the orbital tumors and 0.024 cases per 100,000 people aged between 60 to 75. That's still from the literature. That means that it is very rare. Despite doing orbit for so many years, I don't have more than 60 cases of adenoid cystic carcinoma. What we published was 40. After that, we have added about 20 more. That is all we have. You know, that means that it is very rare. What is known? This is a classic article, Henderson's article, where he described adenoid cystic carcinomas to be a treacherous neoplasm. So why did he say that? It because he recognized that the recurrence rate is very high, 55 to 80 percent, despite clinically complete excision. Clinically complete excision is what you have seen, you have excised. You don't know about microscopic residual. Metastasis rate is same, 50 to 80 percent, and mortality is 25 to 80 percent in 5 to 15 years. All this is because it's a Aggressive malignancy and the regional anatomy is quite complex. It has perineural invasion through the nerve. It can go to superior orbital fissure and thereby to the cavernous sinus. It can spread hematogenously. It can have lymphatic spread. So one form of treatment is suboptimal for adenoid cystic carcinoma. If you were to meticulously excise it and believe that the dis disease were to be cured, you're mistaken. It may come up in the cavernous sinus. It may come up intracranially. If you think that, well, I've done excision, now let me give radiation for microscopic residual, again, your treatment will be suboptimal because metastasis will happen either in the lung or somewhere in, in the skeletal system after three, four, five years and the patient may succumb to it. So you have to address it from all the three perspectives. A good surgery plus radiation plus chemotherapy. And when you give radiation to these tumors, you have to be very clear that it has to be extended radiation. Now, what are the tips to surgery in adenoid cystic carcinoma, Subha? Are there any guidelines? What are the oncological principles that you want to follow? Um, one is the... Starting, uh, starting from the incision. Uh, direct approach is preferable. Direct approach is mandatory. Mandatory. Yeah. Because if you do lid crease incision in adenoid cystic carcinoma, you might end up seeding the tumor, the bobby claris everywhere, preceptal. Giving radiation would be extremely impossible in such a situation. You have to have a direct approach right on top of the tumor. That's oncological principle number one. Second? Um, the approach being like uh, the trans arcus approach? Complete excision. What is the approach? transperiosteal approach and it has to be n block excision n block. n block excision is we know that adenoid cystic carcinoma involves the overlying <laughs> periosteum so you have to excise the periosteum lying over the tumor completely on all the sides 
right? So n block excision is mandatory. Third is you should avoid bone cut at all, absolutely. Lateral orbitotomy bone cut is relatively contraindicated unless you cannot excise the tumor without a bone cut. Even marginotomy is contraindicated because you'll be seeding the tumor in the bone trabecule. So bone cut is a big no if you're excising adenocystic carcinoma, whereas pleomorphic adenoma, of course, you can do all that. Okay. TNM classification is for you to be aware of the fact that there is a good TNM classification now. And if the tumor involves the periosteum, if the tumor involves the bone, if the tumor involves adjacent structures, then the grading is much higher. And T4 disease is very difficult to cure. In fact, if you've noted the cases of adenocystic carcinoma that you have assisted or seen in the last one and a half years, Subhav, you'll find that majority of patients that we have dealt with have had periosteal involvement. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we get T4 disease quite commonly, unlike in the West where they may get T2 or T3 disease. This is the most difficult disease to cure. And in this subcategory of patients, if we have 80 or 90% success, then that is considered really good. And that's possible only with multimodal management. Again, looking at the data from previous publications, you find that five-year survival rate is quite dismal. Ranges from 40 to, say, 60 to 40 percent. And numbers are really small in most of the series. And if you look at intra-arterial neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by orbital excentration, classic uh, protocol described by David Say, again, you find that the survival rate is quite low. So multimodal treatment is the way to go possibly. Here, you do three-stepped approach. The first step is to biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Now, this biopsy can be excisional biopsy if the tumor is well circumscribed. As I said, there is no rule for incisional biopsy if the lesion is well circumscribed and does not involve critical structures of the orbit. If it is infiltrative, poorly circumscribed, involves critical structures of the orbit, then you can do an incisional biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. When you do incisional biopsy, it has to be an absolute direct approach, transseptal or transarcus, not transperiosteal, because you don't want to violate the periosteum. At this stage, you need the periosteum for final excision end block. Right? Once you confirm the diagnosis, then you start this patient on new adjuvant chemotherapy which may range from three to six cycles. You can give intra-arterial chemotherapy, but the problem with intra-arterial chemotherapy is that it goes into the tumor, to the tumor specifically, and the patient will not get systemic chemotherapy. The idea of giving new adjuvant chemotherapy is not just to chemoreduce the tumor, but also make sure that microscopic metastasis that has already taken place is also considered for treatment with new adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, once you give new adjuvant chemotherapy, two things happen. One is that the tumor becomes much harder and consolidated. If you notice, whenever we do incisional biopsy in adenocystic carcinoma, it looks quite fragile. When you try to excise such a tumor which is quite fragile and soft or you know, it breathes the periosteum already, then the chance of having macroscopic or microscopic residual left behind after surgery is quite high. But if the periosteum has kind of become fairly adherent to the tumor already and the tumor has become firm to hard in consistency, quite compact, then the chance of complete excision is quite good. So new joint chemotherapy makes the tumor compact and hard. It may not reduce the size of the tumor beyond say 20-30%. You don't find dramatic regression or uh, reduction in the size of the tumor, but the tumor definitely becomes harder and more compact, making surgery easier. So when you do surgery, you do end block excision again without bone cut, followed by radiation, which is extended radiation. Extended field radiation. So what exactly is extended field radiation? Ten millimeters from the uh, orbital rim, including the uh, superior orbital rim. Ten. 
10 millimeters from the extent of the tumor. Okay. Superior orbital fissure and uh, uh, like on radiological assessment, we'll know if cavernous sinus is involved or not. Irrespective of that. Okay. Irrespective okay. of that. So radiation should be given to the entire pre-treatment extent of the tumor. Mm -hmm. That means the largest dimension of the tumor. Very important. You cannot show the radiation oncologist some new CT scan or MRI and say that this is where we want radiation given. You have to give them documentation of the largest extent of the tumor plus 10 millimeter plus superior so, orbital fissure plus inferior orbital fissure plus so, cavernous sinus plus temporalis. Yes. That is the extent of radiation that is given for adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland 6000 to 6500 centigrade doctor ready has a lecture and he'll speak on it in more detail but you have to give aggressive radiation and cavernous sinus because that is the port through which the tumor gets into the brain so you don't spare the cavernous sinus you give radiation to the cavernous sinus also so if you send the patient for just radiation you know, without discussing with the radiation oncologist, what all do you want to be included? And if the radiation oncologist does not have experience in giving radiation for adenoid cystic carcinoma, he'll miss out all that. And he'll give a good dose of radiation to the bed of the tumor, which is not going to help you at all because that is not where it recurs. It does not recur in the bed of the tumor. It does not, does hardly ever recur in the original site of the tumor. It comes back in the cavernous sinus. It comes back in the orbital apex. It comes back intracranially. That is where you want to give radiation. And then, of course, adjuvant chemotherapy role. People say it is controversial, but we have very clearly shown that whenever we give adjuvant chemotherapy, the chance of systemic metastasis is much less. Right. So that is the way to go. New adjuvant chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and adjuvant chemotherapy. You see in this patient, the role of chemotherapy is of course you don't see dramatic reduction but medial rectus now is quite clear from the tumor earlier it was involved that's an advantage because now you can easily save the medial rectus you can take this bit off and the rest of the tumor can be removed with the periosteum and you can see that this patient had a bone defect right so despite which surgery was fairly easy following neoadjuvant chemotherapy because the tumor had become quite compact. This is one more patient where this tumor has been taken out quite compact. And you can see this is one patient where surgery is being performed. As you can see this nice bone defect here where end block excision is being demonstrated. Periosteum is adherent to the bone here. So you have to be careful in separating the periosteum from the bone using whatever blunt instruments that you have at your disposal. Here I'm using a lid spatula to separate the periosteum. You pick up the periosteum on top of the tumor and make this horizontal incision. So periosteum is adherent to the tumor. Beyond that, you inspect how far is it adherent and beyond that, you go 10 millimeter. You can see that spatula is held under the periosteum and the periosteum is incised. Rest of the dissection is with blunt and sharp instruments. Cryo at some point, you can see that the tumor is adherent to the fat as well. So everything that is adherent to the tumor has to come out with the tumor. There's no point leaving something behind. Whatever that is not adherent, of course, you spare. That's complete excision of the adenoid cystic carcinoma. And what is to be appreciated is that bone remodels. Earlier, it was believed that patient who has bone affection with adenoid cystic carcinoma, you should do orbitectomy. That means that you would excise all this bone and do cranioplastic surgery to repair that roof of orbit. But no longer so, you simply excise the tumor, give radiation, give a joint chemotherapy and the bone comes back. Nothing has been done to the bone here. A child with adenoid cystic carcinoma, completely deranged, destroyed bone, completely remodeled following treatment. So bone is something that you don't touch in adenoid cystic carcinoma. Unlike the previous belief that the bone has to be excised. Now, what if somebody has already done a surgery for this patient and it has recurred and radiation has already been given, so you have no scope of giving additional external beam radiation. In such situations, when you excise it, 
you can implant tubes like this. This is called afterloaded brachytherapy technique, which we have at our disposal. Earlier, our radiation oncologist was very specific that we should drill the bone and give it. I was uh, not very convinced about it. Now, we don't drill the bone at all. Again, principle is that we should not touch the bone in a cystic carcinoma. We uh, do without that. We implant these silicon tubes and lock these tubes using these nice blue buttons and send the patient to the radiation oncologist like this post-operatively on the second or third day with an occlusive dressing. And the patient is given afterloaded interstitial brachytherapy with iridium-192. These sources are sent through these tubes and they reach the bed of the tumor and they irradiate that particular area where there was local tumor recurrence because there will be microscopic residual within the bone in that area and that is taken care of. This is to show the results of the study where group 1 surgery radiation, group 2 surgery radiation and chemotherapy and group 3 is multimodal treatment where chemo, surgery, radiation and additional adjuvant chemotherapy. Numbers are low. You cannot do statistical validation for such a study where the disease itself is so rare. But the results, even without looking at the percentages, you can see that eye salvage rate has remarkably improved with multimodal treatment. Need for orbital excentration has reduced. Obviously, when the eye is saved, vision can save, be saved. Systemic metastasis has become very rare and mortality has become very rare with multimodal treatment. You cannot say that they remain zero at the end of 10, 15 years. This is just a five-year follow-up. We obviously will need much longer follow-up. So point number seven for lacrimal gland tumors is multimodal treatment improves life and vision salvage in adenocystic carcinoma. So last slide. So obviously in lacrimal gland tumors, which is such a large spectrum and a mixed bag, you have to go with the entire clinical setting of the tumor or the lesion, unilateral, bilateral, palpebral lobe, orbital lobe or both, Schirmer's lobe, normal, functional disturbances present or not, duration of symptoms, additional symptoms such as abnormal sensations, pain, etc. Has it crossed the midline? Has the bone been affected? So it's a good clinico-radiological correlation. That is what is important before you jump to perform biopsy. And whenever we do biopsy, don't disturb the periosteum. Do a direct approach. Do either a transeptal or transarcus approach. If that is feasible, only when it is not feasible, feasible then you go transperiosteal. Whenever you find a well-circumscribed tumor, whether it is benign or malignant, try to completely excise it without breaching the capsule because that would give the best prognosis to the patient. Whenever it's an infiltrative tumor, you are justified in performing an incisional biopsy, limited direct approach incisional biopsy, confirming the diagnosis and do, going further. Why do you need to do incisional biopsy? Because you don't know clinically radiologically that if you're dealing with adenocarcinoma or adenocystic carcinoma. That is a role for even in intraoperative pathology. If you're not very sure that it is adenocystic carcinoma, then do an intraoperative pathology. Mm -hmm. If the pathologist were to tell you that it is adenocarcinoma, then you have no choice but to completely excise it because adenocarcinoma does not respond to chemotherapy or radiation. Both of these remain very remotely adjuvant in such situations. So where you have adenocarcinoma, you are supposed to completely excise the tumor or even do orbital excentration. Whenever you have adenocystic carcinoma, of course, you have multimodal treatment. So that's about it. I have overshot time, I think, by 10 minutes. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, taking us through the entire spectrum of uh, lacrimal gland lesions. Uh, sir, we do have a few questions from uh, different social media portals. So the first question is, uh, uh, when there is an intraoperative bridge of capsule in a probable case of pleomorphic adenoma, how do we manage it? Limit the breach. So if you have a focal breach, you can use sinoclate glue to you know limit the breach. If you are applying cryoprobe and at that point it has breached, then immediately shift the position of the cryoprobe to a much secure area, right? So you can do all these maneuvers. And if you if the spill is very large, that means that capsule breach is very large and if you really spilt it, you have to meticulously remove every bit of what is visible. 
And sir, in a clinical case scenario, when the clinical features are not very clear, either it's a pleomorphic adenoma or adenoid cystic carcinoma, how do we approach that case? Do we go for excision biopsy, keeping in mind that it is a pleomorphic adenoma, or do we approach uh, it with incision biopsy, uh, probably so thinking I, I it's adenoid? I would do something adenoid. in between. I would do a PET scan. Right? Even on MRI, it's uh, possible to differentiate pleomorphic adenoma from adenoid cystic carcinoma. What is not easily possible is differentiating adenocarcinoma from adenoid cystic carcinoma. So, PET scan would be positive for adenoid cystic carcinoma because it's a large tumor. And if PET being positive, then depending on well circumscribed or not, you would do an excisional biopsy or an incision. Sir, and in a case of acute tacroadenitis, when do we perform incision biopsy? Like, is there any particular duration? Acute, we don't do. Acute is mainly infective. When it is subacute or chronic, when you're not sure whether it is infective or not, then you do incision biopsy. And sir, uh, what is the role of PET scan in case of uh, mucoepidermoid variant of adenoid cystic carcinoma? Mucoepidermoid is very rare. PET is only, you know, to know whether it has any metabolic activity or not. So if you have a lacrimal gland tumor, you're not sure whether it's benign or malignant, as already mentioned, you can do a PET scan. Second is to know whether there's any regional spread or systemic spread. That is the role of PET scan. Thank you so much, sir. These are all the questions we had for the day. Sir, yes, I'm everything not... you have covered very well in your entire life. Pratika, any questions? Yeah. Excuse me, sir. I had one question, sir. Yeah. Sir, last week we happened to see a case where uh, MRI, uh, uh, like uh, clinically, it looked more of an inflammatory pathology, but MRI was appointed as inflammation versus uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma in a young patient. Hmm. And uh, we, had, uh, we went ahead with the, like, our plan is to do a multi-level incision biopsy in that case. Uh, because his uh, blood profile and serum IgG4 levels all were, like, all were borderline. Yes. So, in that uh, scenario, like, what on uh, radiologic uh, must have prompted for a possible diagnosis of adenoid cystic carcinoma in that patient? Well, I... I... You, I think you should ask Ravi Verma why he, you know, favored adenoid cystic carcinoma in that patient. So, mm -hmm. clinically it was inflammation, but radiological opinion was that it could be adenoid cystic carcinoma. And the patient had paresthesia and pain as well, and all the parameters were borderline. So, mm -hmm. in such a situation, you can't be sure whether it is adenoid cystic carcinoma or inflammation. So, biopsy is the way to go. And imaging also, uh, did, like there's molding around the globe, no bony defect, no irregularity. Yeah. So these are indeterminate situations. Whenever you have an indeterminate situation where clinical radiologically you have doubt that it could be that or this, then biopsy is the way to go. You don't depend too much on your clinical acumen in such a situation. You depend on histopathology because that's definite. Before we conclude, uh, I have a small announcement to make. Next, we meet on February 2nd, that is Friday, and Dr. Sara will be speaking to us on secondary and metastatic orbital tumors. Thank you, sir. Thank Good you, night, sir. everyone. Yes.